Welcome to our series of programs titled Dominating Your Finances. Are there steps you can take to dominate your finances? Yes, there are seven steps you can take to dominate your finances. The first step is seek first the kingdom of God. The second step is to work hard. The third step is to create a business plan. The fourth step is to give tithes and offerings to the creator. The fifth step is to give tithes to yourself for the seven annual appointments with God. And then the sixth point is to fund your emergency savings and retirement accounts. And the seventh is to pay your bills. Now, when it comes to points four through seven, this is just as critical as points one through three. Points four through seven talk about how to divvy up the money that you earn. Of course, you have to have a plan. That's point three. You got to work hard. That's point two. And everything that sets it off is seeking first the kingdom of God. That's point number one. But once God gives you an increase, once you have money, what are you going to do with it? Now, we're going to cover these points, all seven of these points in depth. But you see in parentheses for point four, I have 10% plus 5%. As an example, tithes, we know is 10%, where it talks about giving tithes. That's the 10%. And offerings, that's 5%. Now, these parts about the offerings, that's not set in stone. You give whatever your heart uh, inspires you to do, whatever you think you can do. Uh, so that's not set in stone. Of course, tithing is 10%. Whatever you want to give above that as an offering, that's up to you. I'm just suggesting 5% uh, is an easy way for you to think about dominating your finances. Point number five, give tithes to yourself for the seven annual appointments with God. So that's obviously another 10%, and this is biblical, whereas if you are observing the seven annual appointments, which all of us should be doing according to Scripture, then you will be setting aside another 10% as God has commanded. Point number six, only after you have done point number four and five, only after you have done points four and five, should you go to point six. And that is to fund your emergency, fund your savings, and fund your retirement accounts. Again, these are suggestive amounts here. So funding your emergency, maybe put away 5% <coughs> Excuse me, of each paycheck. Put away 10% for savings and put away 10% for your retirement accounts. And again, we'll go into depth to explain the difference between those three. And then only after you've done points four, five, and six, only after you've done points four, five, and six, should you do point seven, which is to pay your bills. If you follow the sequence of steps, you will learn to dominate your finances. And doing them in this sequence is important. Again, as we get through all seven of these points in depth, hopefully it will become very, very clear, absolutely clear, the brilliance of following God's plan in this sequence, the way God wants it to be done. Okay, so in this particular program, we're going to be talking only about point one, and then, God willing, we'll have seven other or six other programs to make up the seven different programs, the seven different steps. So step number one, seek first the kingdom of God. That's what we're going to be covering. Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 6. This will be Matthew chapter 6, and we want to read verses 19 through 21. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. And again, this has to do with our first point, seeking first the kingdom of God. In Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 19, it says, Do not lay up treasures on earth for yourselves, 
where moth and rust corrupts and where thieves break through and steal. In other words, what God is saying is we can't serve two masters. Our primary goal in life should not be to accumulate physical wealth. That's the treasures on earth. It is totally fine, absolutely fine, to strive to be financially independent, to be wealthy. Abraham was a person who was wealthy. Joseph was a person who was wealthy. And there's numerous other people in scriptures that were wealthy. And nothing in scripture forbids a person accumulating wealth. It is simply a matter of our priority. If our priority is to accumulate wealth to the exclusion of God, that is the problem. So that's what this is talking about in verse 19. Do not lay up treasures on earth for yourselves because eventually these treasures are going to disappear. Whether you pass them on to your heirs and then they run through the money or whether you have it invested, something happens with the market and you're wiped out, whatever it is, stuff is going to happen. And one of the worst things, of course, is that you could have somebody steal your money from you, which has happened in the past. So don't have that as your number one priority to the exclusion of God. That's what it is saying in verse 19. Now let's continue to verse 20. But instead of laying up treasures on earth, what you should be doing, what all of us need to be doing as our priority is laying up treasures in heaven for ourselves. In particular, since we're speaking to you, but lay up treasures in heaven for yourselves where neither moth nor rust corrupts and where thieves do not break through or steal. This spiritual wealth that God is talking about you're not gonna have any possibility for that to be eaten up by moss or for the spiritual wealth to be corrupted with rust, or God is not gonna allow any thieves to break through and steal what you have accumulated in this life that is spiritual wealth. And we're gonna talk exactly about what this spiritual wealth is, what this treasures in heaven is. And then in verse 21, where your treasure is, there, there will be your heart also. So this is what I was saying at the beginning. This is what scripture says. This is what God reveals to us. If we put our heart in physical treasure, that's where my heart's going to be. I'm going to spend my thoughts, my emotions, my actions with that as my primary goal. And my spiritual accumulation of wealth will suffer. And so that is a problem. And God is telling us, make sure that your heart is focused on the right place. So what are the, and I have the dots here because you should know what this question is. What are the blank, 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 dot, 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 that we should be laying up? What are the treasures in heaven? That's the question. What are the treasures in heaven that we should be laying up? That is the question, and we're going to go into this in depth. In Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 22, Matthew chapter 19 and verses 16 through 22, this begins to give us an understanding of what it means, treasures in heaven. So Matthew chapter 19, verse 16, here's a story of a rich young man that came to Yeshua and asked him a question. He said, teacher, what good things shall I do to have eternal life? Now, first of all, this is a very, very audacious question because he has the nerve to ask, what can I do to have eternal life? As though anybody can do something to have eternal life. So right off the bat, he totally missed the point. What is the point? The point is that eternal life is a gift, is not something that we can work to earn. So that was a problem right off the bat. 
And then in verse 17, Yeshua responds to him and he says, okay, keep the commandments. Now Yeshua knows that nobody can keep the commandments and therefore earn eternal life. But he was putting this guy in check because he didn't want the guy to wreck himself. So before he wrecked himself, Yeshua wanted him to check himself. That's why this question was answered in this way. Keep the commandments. If you think, rich young man, that you can do something to earn you eternal life, then try it. Go ahead and keep the commandments. So the rich young man, in his very arrogant, presumptuous, self-righteous way, in verse 18 says, well, which ones? And Yeshua said, okay, don't murder, don't steal, don't lie, don't commit adultery, honor your parents, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, when we talk about keeping the commandments, here's something that's very clear that shows that Yeshua wants us to keep the commandments. The commandments are still in effect today, but they don't earn us eternal life. We keep the commandments only because, as it says in verse 19, these that he mentioned specifically teach us how to love our neighbors as ourselves. So it's a way of life that God wants us to live. So all of God's commandments, including the fourth commandment, which is the seventh day Sabbath, God still wants us to keep all of his commandments, all 10 of them. Now in this particular case, and this is a question for you, Yeshua is answering this rich young man, and he says to him, don't murder, don't steal, don't lie, don't commit adultery, honor your parents. That's five out of the Ten Commandments, and specifically, it's five out of the six commandments that teach us how to love our neighbor as ourselves. The first four of God's Ten Commandments teach us how to love God. The last six of the Ten Commandments teach us how to love our neighbors as ourselves. Yeshua, enlisting the commandments that talk about loving your neighbor as yourself, lists five out of the six. Which one did not Yeshua mention? That's the question for you. Which out of the six commandments that teach us how to love our neighbors out of ourselves, which out of the six did Yeshua not mention? He mentions five, but he omits one. Which one did he omit? If you know the answer to that, that's going to give you a big clue as to how Yeshua was putting this person in check. Now going on to verse 20, it says, the young man responded, oh, well, shoot, all of these I've kept. Yeah, so you told me, Yeshua, I asked you a question. What do I have to do to have eternal life? You said keep the commandments. You listed them. I did them. I kept all of them. So you tell me now, what do I lack? And Yeshua responds to him in verse 21. All right, young man, go sell what you own and give to the poor. And if you give to the poor, having sold all that you own, then you will have treasures in heaven. What was the young man's response? Verse 22. But when the young man heard this, he went away grieving, for he had great possessions. It's like, yo, Jesus, I don't think I want to hear this. I spent my life accumulating these riches. I've kept the commandments that you specified. So I'm not about to give up my wealth and give to the poor just so I can have treasures in heaven. I don't understand this because I asked you a question. What do I have to do to earn eternal life? You said keep the commandments. You listed them. I've kept them. So I don't think I lack anything. So the fact that you're asking me to do more, I don't believe you're being fair. So that's too much. That's too far of a bridge to cross, too much to sacrifice. I don't think I need to do that. So I'll see you later. Now, what 
really was the essence. Yeshua knew this person's heart. Remember we said, wherever your heart is, that's where your treasure is going to be. Wherever, and your heart has to do with your emotions. So it's like whatever you feel so strongly about, that's where you're going to put your effort to accumulate the treasures. That's the actions you're going to follow on a regular basis. So for instance, if there's eight hours in the day when you're going to work at something, you're going to work at accumulating wealth. Of course, sleeping eight hours, so that's 16 hours. Then you have eight other hours in a 24 hour day. So you're sleeping, you're working. Well, what else are you gonna do with your eight hours? If another seven or eight of those hours are spent focusing on accumulating wealth and there's virtually no time for God or for other people, then that's showing that your heart is based on the treasures. That's, that's what consumes you, your thoughts, your emotions, lead you to those actions. And Yeshua had said, don't lay up treasures on earth, lay up treasures in heaven. And he's talking to this rich young man saying, give away your treasures on earth and then you'll have treasures in heaven. So I'm gonna ask you again, which one of the last six commandments out of the 10, and the last six teach us how to love our neighbors as ourselves, which one did Yeshua omit? And the answer is, thou shalt not covet, is the 10th commandment. Thou shalt not covet. In other words, coveting means that we want to get, we want to get everything for ourselves. Oh, I see over here where I can make another dollar. Let me go over here and make this dollar, even though it could hurt somebody. Let me go over here and get another dollar, although it could hurt the environment in some way. Like saying, I want to go into this pristine forest, and I want to just totally wipe out this forest because I want to sell all of the wood. And then you destroy the habitat for the animals. You might create global warming, for instance. You could even displace some of the people who had lived on the land and you pay them little to nothing. You might have even pushed them off the land. That's the type of covetousness that a person has, or it could simply be, listen, this is my money. I work for it. I'm not giving a dime to anybody else. That selfish attitude. Even if you didn't necessarily hurt somebody in accumulating it, just the fact that a person is so selfish, not wanting to share anything, though this person, for instance, might have gotten rich because people are paying them for their services. And it's like all of these people who are paying you for your services and all the people who work for you that are trying to you know, pour their blood, sweat, and tears into your business to help you succeed. And then when one of them gets sick, you can't even visit them in the hospital. You can't offer to pay a part of their medical bill, for instance. You're just so selfish because you want to hold on to this money that you've accumulated. Well, that's what was obviously in this rich person's heart is a covetous attitude. That's what was in his mind. And so his actions, because you remember in our previous series where we we're talking about dominate your dominion, we said a person has to dominate their T. T is an acronym. T-E-A is an acronym for dominating your thoughts. That's the T. Dominating your emotions. That's the E. And dominating your actions. That's the A. And again, doing it in that sequence, saying, let me think about this. Then that creates the emotions. Then I have actions. Well, this person thought about, is my money, I spent all this time accumulating it. His emotions were, I'm going to hoard it for myself because I'm going to buy this big yacht. I'm going to buy this private jet. I'm going to travel all over the world, stay at the most expensive hotels. I'm going to buy 20 cars, and I don't care about anybody else. That's a covetous type attitude. That's a terrible attitude. 
and it led to those kinds of selfish actions. So he was not dominating his thoughts, emotions, and actions in a godly manner. And God in the flesh, Jesus the Christ, said, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. I'm going to help you to check yourself by telling you you should not be covetous. You should, instead of being selfish and wanting to get stuff, you should give to the poor. That helps us to understand what it means building up treasures in heaven. It means whatever resources we have that have been given to us from God who is in heaven and who controls the heavens and the earth, all of this power and ability to get wealth that's been given to us should in turn be given to others who are less fortunate than us. Now, again, people can make a judgment. Oh, well, you know, it's a poor person and they're poor because they're lazy. They're poor because they're stupid and they never got a good education. And so therefore they can't get hired into a good job. And that's their fault. Not understanding that there are very extenuating circumstances. Like for instance, Unfortunately, a woman might get pregnant, and we know all too often a man just will abandon the woman and abandon his child. So, and then the woman might say, well, I'm in no shape to take care of a child out of love, even though it hurts me. I want to put my child up for adoption. But first, the child goes into foster care. The child, unfortunately, is mentally abused, verbally abused, maybe even physically abused, not taught anything. It's not the child's fault. Then when they get out into the world, they might go from foster home to foster home. Then they're pushed out into the world when they're 18, never having been adopted by a loving family. This person doesn't have education. This person doesn't have self-confidence. They have no guidance and direction. And yeah, maybe they might even end up stealing something because they're homeless and they need food. Nobody, again, wants to hire them. Maybe it's even in a serious recession at the point when they're pushed out of the foster home and they're poor, not because they're a bad, lazy person. It's just because they've had bad circumstances. So there's legitimate reasons why people are poor and it's not to condemn them. We shouldn't be condemning them. So yes, we should be looking for opportunities to give to the poor. And that's how we're going to build up treasures in heaven because what God is saying is, you know, I don't need you to give to the poor. I could snap my finger and poverty would be eliminated. But I'm giving you the opportunity to be like me. And that is a great privilege. That is a great honor. God is the greatest giver. And if we can act like God, act even on behalf of God as the body of Christ, and Christ is God, so as the body of God, as the embodiment of God on earth, to be able to do God's will on earth, which means to give to the poor, to give to the needy, to give of the riches that we've been blessed with, to enrich somebody else, that's where we're building up treasures in heaven. Because God says, listen, if you do that, when you do get to heaven, or when heaven comes down to you, believe me, I am going to richly reward you above what you could even ask or think, because you have shown yourself to be like me. And I appreciate it, and I'm going to show you that it is absolutely the best way of life. You think about who you can give to your emotions, like I want to do this out of love, you do it, that's your action. Then the emotion that you feel after that, you feel so good. And hopefully the people that you help tell you how much you've helped them and you feel really good about it, that motivates you to do more. And you keep in that cycle of giving and you keep giving God opportunities to give to you and you keep giving God reasons to say, boy, oh boy, when they meet me face to face, I'm going to have so many gifts for them to enrich them beyond their wildest dreams that they can't even imagine what it's going to be like.
So that's what God is talking about, building up treasures in heaven. Now, again, having said all of that, we should not be giving to the poor so we can get riches in heaven. It should be from the heart simply because we love, okay? All right, so let's go on. Matthew chapter 12. Now, Matthew chapter 12, verses 34 through 35. This is Matthew chapter 12 and verses 34 through 35. Now, Yeshua is talking to people who claim to be religious and yet they're self-righteous. They're hard on other people, not a lot of mercy, not a lot of compassion, not a lot of generosity. And whenever they are generous, they give to be seen by other people. So it's really not doing it because they love people. They're doing it because they love to have the adoration of people. So he is saying some very harsh words. Yeshua is speaking. He's saying, you offspring of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And you see this graphic here where you have a heart and there's a plug and the mouth is plugged in to the heart. So the heart gives the electricity, the energy to the mouth. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What comes out of a person is what's really in there. Eventually, if you watch a person long enough, if you hear a person talking often enough, you're going to be able to detect what's really inside because eventually their true nature is going to come out. And so in verse 35, Yeshua continues, a good, a good man or woman out of the good treasure of the heart brings out good things. And an evil man or woman out of the evil treasure brings out evil things. So again, we're starting to understand when we're seeking first the kingdom of God, it's laying up treasures in heaven. We saw that the attitude should be giving to the poor. That's our thoughts. It should be out of the heart, the abundance of the heart that is filled with love, loving your neighbor as yourself, giving without expecting anything in return. That's the emotion part. I, I really want to do this. It makes me feel good. I'm doing it out of love. And then the action is literally giving food to people. And now we see in verse 35 saying that a good person out of the good treasures of the heart, that's where the treasures are in the heart. And then it comes out in the mouth saying, excuse me, Sir, or excuse me, ma'am, do you mind if I take you to the grocery store to buy you a week's worth of food? I know that you're struggling, and I just want to help you out. Boom, that's it. Because of the goodness of a person's heart, they have been increased with goods. They want to increase other people's goods by doing good things for them. It could be something like, um, some young people who have never, ever been to a summer camp before. Every summer when school is over, they're kind of stuck in the house, and maybe they live in the projects, and they have never been more than 10 blocks away from their apartment complex, or what is often known as projects, which are really kind of run down apartment complexes, huge apartment complexes. They've never been 10, further than 10 blocks away. Maybe because it's so dangerous, there's drug addicts on every corner, there's uh, murders that happen so frequently. And so they just kind of stick to where they are and they're often, again, it might be a single mom who's working two, three jobs, hardly ever there and tells their child, I love you, I'm scared for you, please stay in the house, don't go out, or let me know when you go out and you can be with certain friends, because I know that they're decent people. And you hear about these children in these situations, again, through no fault of their own. And you say, you know what, they've never been to a summer camp before. They've never been out in beautiful nature, never been fishing. They've never uh, been swimming in a lake 
or in the sea or in the ocean. They've never been on a jet ski. They've never done parasailing. They've never done these kinds of wonderful things that just opens up a whole new world to them to see endless possibilities. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to sponsor maybe five kids to go to summer camp. It may cost $500 per kid. So I'm going to give $2,500 to sponsor five kids to go to camp, simply because you know that you had the opportunity to go to camp and you know how life-changing that was, how it transformed you, gave you so much confidence that you could do rock climbing, for instance, that you could learn how to maybe uh, shoot a bow and arrow, and just so many different things that an inner city child would perhaps never get a chance to do. And you had that chance because somebody took an interest in you. And so you want to pay it forward just out of the good treasures of your heart. That's what God is talking about when he says, seek first the kingdom of God and build up treasures in heaven by loving your neighbor as yourself, by giving to the poor, by being generous, having that kind of mentality, the kind of emotions that moves you with compassion and propels you to do something and that doing something that's concrete actions to help somebody. That is so beautiful and that's what God wants us to do. So Matthew chapter 13 now, verse 44. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 44. Here it says, and this is a parable, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure. So we're talking about treasures in heaven. And we're saying the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that's hidden in the field, which a man found and then hid. And because of his joy, he went out and sold all that he had and bought that field. This person knows that this field is priceless. And what he can gain from the treasures that have been hidden in that field is worth more than what he currently possesses. So he exchanges his physical possessions for spiritual possessions. And the kingdom of heaven, of course, is a spiritual thing. So the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that's hidden. We need to search it out. We need to seek the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God who's in heaven, who rules from heaven. We need to seek this first and foremost above and beyond any and everything else, seeking to do the will of God, seeking to be like God. And God is love, and if God is in us, then we must be love. That's what God is talking about. And because of a person's joy, I mean extreme joy, unspeakable joy, that they have found this way of life that God lives, God is a giver. God is love. He generously gives. He pours out his blessings. He opens up the windows of heaven, his storehouses, and pours down his blessings. Like, for instance, sunshine, which all of us need, and rain in due season. Dirt that has somehow miraculously chemicals in there that when you put a seed in it and there's adequate sunshine and adequate rain that this seed germinates and produces food like oranges, like tomatoes, like lettuce, like broccoli, and yes, broccoli is good, and like sweet potatoes, and like cherries, and like so many other things. And not only that, God gives us meat to eat. So he gives us plenty of fish in the sea, salmon, halibut, all kinds of great tasting fish. God gives abundantly, generously to us. So therefore, if we want to be like God, we should seek first the kingdom of God. We should look at the kingdom of God, this kingdom of heaven, as being a treasure that is priceless and go and sell every physical thing we have and be a part of this wonderful way of life, this wonderful cycle of giving to other people.
showing love to other people. That's what God wants us to do. And if that's the kind of joy that fills our heart, then boy, oh boy, God is very, very pleased when he looks at us and sees our thoughts, sees our emotions, and sees our action. He sees a beautiful cup of tea. Remember, tea is an acronym for thoughts, emotions, and actions. God looks at us and he sees this delicious, aromatic cup of tea that is you and me. So laying up treasures in heaven means that we do the right things, as an example, giving to the poor, and we do the right things for the right reason. The right reason, it's a treasure of love that's in our heart that we pour out to other people to enrich their lives. So laying up treasures in heaven means that we do the right things for the right reasons. What is a right thing? Giving to the poor. The right reason is because we have love. So if we do the right things for the right reasons, we are laying up treasures in heaven. We are seeking first the kingdom of heaven, which is the kingdom of God. Now let's continue in Matthew chapter 6, and we want to read verses 25 through 32, but I've rearranged this so to make it a little bit easier to understand. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 32. First, we're going to read verse 25. It says, don't be anxious about your life. What you shall wear or eat is not life more than clothing and food. So in other words, we're not just some animal that seeks only to eat and seeks only to reproduce. All right? That's not who we are. God has created us in his image, in his likeness, that means we need to be like God, and God is much more than, oh, what am I going to eat today, or what am I going to wear today? God is so much more than that, so we need to be so much more than that, and God is telling us one of the impediments to being like him, one of the impediments of giving, entering into the cycle of giving, is being anxious about our lives because then we're turning the spotlight inward and looking at ourselves and saying, I am afraid of the future that I might not have enough to eat or clothes to wear. So therefore, I'm going to focus just on me. I'm not going to live this giving way of life. I'm going to live this get way of life selfish. I'm going to lay up treasures on earth. That's what it's saying here. He's, and Jesus is saying, don't be anxious about your life. Don't worry about the future because I've got you. I'm going to take care of you. If you are in this cycle of giving, I'm going to make sure that I give to you so you can give to others. All right? So, so don't stop this cycle. Don't break this cycle by saying, I got to look out for number one because nobody else is looking out for me. That's not true. God is looking out for you. So let God be God, and, and you be like God, and you help other people. All right, so don't be anxious worrying about your life, what you're going to wear, or what you're going to eat. Is not life more than clothing and food, the, the accumulation of food and clothing? Isn't it more than that? Yes, it is. Now in verse 28, Consider the lilies of the field. Look at these beautiful pictures. Look at those beautiful lilies. Consider the lilies of the field. How do they grow? Ask yourself that question. Just meditate on this for a minute. You can pause the video and just think about how do lilies of the field grow? Do they buy materials and then sew their clothes? Of course, that's what we as human beings do. We do need to work so that we can buy material and then sew our clothes, or we need to work so that we can go to a store where somebody else has already purchased the material and 
sewn the clothes. So yeah, we need to take care of ourselves. But God, again, wants us to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. We don't want to wreck ourselves and get out of this cycle of giving by running off the road. Stay on the road. Stay in this cycle of giving. So he's asking us this question to check ourselves so we don't wreck ourselves. Do they buy or sew clothes? The answer is no. They don't do that. So how do they get to be so beautiful then? In verse 29, but even Solomon in all his glory was not dressed like one of these. Solomon had a lot of money, so he could buy a lot of material, and he had a lot of people who were very skilled at sewing clothes. And so Solomon was decked to the nines. Solomon dressed to the T. When he stepped out, people said, whoa, man, you look sharp. Those are some nice clothes. But Solomon, in all of his glory, did not look as handsome or as beautiful, as splendid to the eye as these lilies. Just look at the glory of these beautiful flowers. No, Solomon couldn't match that, and nobody else can match the beauty, the glory of these flowers. So then if these flowers don't go out and buy material and then sew their own clothes to look this beautiful, then how do they get so beautiful? Who takes care of them? In verse 30 now, therefore, if our provider clothes the grass of the field and these lilies, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the fire because they wither away. And then when you're cleaning up, you might throw them in the fire or you throw them in the compost, whatever. But they're here today, they're gone tomorrow. If our provider makes them so beautiful, that's the one who makes them so beautiful. Our provider is the one who, in effect, buys their clothes or buys their material and sews their clothes. Our provider is the one that makes these lilies of the valley so beautiful that they exceed the glory of Solomon. So our provider is the one who provides for them. And these are simple flowers. As beautiful as they are, they're here today and they're gone tomorrow. In a split second, all of that beauty fades away. But these plants are not created in the image and likeness of God. Only human beings are created in the image and likeness of God. God has destined us to be born into his family, born again as spirit-composed, eternal children of God with perfect hearts and minds of love. That is our incredible human potential. So he asked the question, if I can provide for these lilies, will I not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? God is saying, I'm not so much concerned about these lilies of the field that I'm going to take care of them more than I'm going to take care of you. That's ridiculous. You are destined to be my children. Of course, I'm going to take care of you much more than I take care of these flowers. So why do you have so little faith that you don't trust that I'm going to provide for you so you get outside of the circle of giving and you decide that you have to get into the circle of get, which excludes other people. You become covetous like this rich young person that when I ask you to give to the poor, you go away sorrowful because you don't have faith that I'm going to resupply you after you give. You don't believe I'm going to put back into your storehouse so you can have something else to give and I'm going to put back more. And eventually, even though you're giving let's say $100 away, somehow you find out that you have $200 in your account. You give away another $100, you see $200 more put in. It's like, wow, how am I increasing in my wealth when I'm giving away so much? Well, it's because God is giving to you much more than you could ever give to others because God wants you to see the value, the goodness, the benefit, the blessing of being in this cycle of giving. 
God wants you to see that just like he is love, you should be loved because it's a lovely thing to be so generous to people, to see smiles on their faces, to see lives turned around, maybe for you to help somebody to avoid committing suicide because you might be the first person that showed that individual love and now they feel like their lives matter. That's what you can do for people, to actually help give people life and give them life abundantly, to give them a joy that's unspeakable. That's what you can do. That's the power that you can have if you lay up treasures in heaven out of the goodness of, and the abundance of the treasures that's in your mind and your heart in your thoughts and in your emotions that lead you to right actions. So don't have little faith and short circuit this plan that God wants you to have. Don't be going down the pathway that God wants you on, this cycle of giving, and then you say, but you know what? I, I don't think God's gonna be able to give to me anymore. So I'm gonna take a different road and this different road actually leads into, unfortunately, a big old chasm where you run out of road and run into a big chasm and you wreck yourself. Your car is totally destroyed. You're totally, your life is totally destroyed. God says, stay on the path. Don't have so little faith that this path isn't going to lead you to where you want to be that this path of you giving to others isn't going to lead to you having enough for yourself. I will provide for you much more than what I've provided for these lilies of the field, which are here today and gone tomorrow. Verse 29, look at these birds. Look at these beautiful birds, the colors. Oh, it's fantastic. So behold the birds of the air, for they don't sow, nor do they reap, nor do they gather into barns. Verse 26, yet your Father in heaven feeds them. And this sign to the right, where it says no fishing is funny. That's a sign put up for human beings. But one of the things God has done is provide an abundance of fish. And notice that not all fish are big old gigantic whales or whale sharks. God provides like sardines, small fish that small birds can eat, that seagulls can eat, that owls can eat, that eagles can eat. And you see on the left-hand side, this eagle swooping down, and that's probably a big old salmon that has swept up in this town. Our Father provides for the bird. The birds didn't have to say, well, let me go out and build a business where I can trap these birds, I mean, where I can trap these uh, fish, and let me develop some talons or some claws, and let me develop these big old wings where I can just jump off of a, a branch and I'm so fast and so stealth that I can just swoop down and my eyes are so perfect that I can actually see in water, but the refraction doesn't throw me off. I have these eyes where I can see right into the water and I can swoop down and, and grab this big old salmon. Well, God is the one who designed the eagle to be like that. So no, they don't have to go through all of that. God is the one who designed the eagle to be like that. God is the one who designed the fish to be in the oceans and the seas and to lakes and rivers and streams. God is the one who does that. God is the one who feeds birds. Now, I'm not going to call birds dumb because they're pretty smart, but it's like you bird brain. Birds have little brains, and that's why you get that term. But applying it to a person who's stupid, who thinks that they have to do everything for themselves and don't have the faith that if they're in God's cycle of giving, 
that they're not going to have enough to give to others and still to take care of themselves because they don't have faith that God is going to back up what he says, that it's more blessed to give than to receive because people have that faith and they're so stupid. You say, you bird brain, look at these birds who have these little brains, but God feeds them. He taught them how to swoop down from a branch and just barely graze the surface of the ocean and take out of the ocean these salmon. I mean, God does this. So have faith that he's going to feed these birds. He's going to feed you. If he's going to clothe the lilies of the valley, he's going to clothe you. So don't be anxious. Have faith because faith says, I see the future. I know what it holds. And therefore, I have confidence. Whereas anxiety says, well, I see the future and it's a bad thing. So therefore, I've got to take care of myself. So no, we don't have to do that. God, again, asked the rhetorical question to check ourselves so we don't wreck ourselves. Are you not much better than birds? And of course, the answer is yes. And then in verse 27, we're still in Matthew chapter 6, verse 27. Another question, always probing to, to force us to think. Which of you, by being anxious, fearful about the future, can add one cubit to his or her statue? Can you, by worrying, make yourself grow one inch taller? So you worry, for instance, oh, I'll never make it to the NBA because I'm not tall enough. Well, by your worrying, is that going to make you grow from five foot six to five foot seven and then the next year you worry some more and you grow from five seven to five eight and eventually you get to oh now at least i'm six foot so i can play in the nba well all you're worrying is not going to make you grow so don't worry about it if you're going to grow you're going to grow verse 31 therefore do not be anxious wondering what shall you wear or what shall you eat? Don't be anxious about that. Verse 32, unconverted people seek after all these things. Your Father in heaven knows that you need all of these things. God is a God of prevision and provision. The prevision, he sees in advance what you need. The provision, he provides for that need. God is a God of prevision and provision. So God's got it. God will take care of you. Just make sure that you are taking care of others. Now, again, this does not mean, okay, God's going to take care of me if I take care of others. So I'm going to quit my job and I'm just going to go out and I'm going to, you know, say good things to people. I'm going to pray for people that God blesses you. I'm going to pray for you that you stop being depressed. I'm going to sing songs for you on the, on the corner, for instance. I'm going to just give you pep talks every day. And you're not working and you don't have anything. The person needs food. They don't need just a pep talk. They need some food. It's wintertime. They need some clothes. They don't need you just breathing on them while you're singing or giving them a pep talk and you using up your hot air. They need some clothes. How can you help them? Well, keep your job and take care of them. So when we say that God will take care of you so you can take care of others, it usually means that you need to work to make money because in this world, money is what's needed to buy clothes and to buy food. Now, if you wanted to quit your job, and you just wanted to maybe start a farm because maybe you have some seeds accumulated and you're gonna plant a farm and that's how you're gonna feed people. Well, that's a different story. I mean, you're still gonna to have to work and obviously you're still gonna to have to eat something. So you're gonna to have to eat of the fruit of your own labor. But if you've got a big old farm and you can uh, grow your own food, and then share with others, that's great. But I hope you understand something. You're still working. You might not be working for somebody else where they pay you, but you're still working. You're working the land that God's given to you 
And that's a great thing for you to give to others. So it's not like we can just sit back and say, oh, well, I'm going to pray for people. Praying is important. Don't, under, don't get me wrong and don't underestimate prayer. Prayer is important, but we also need to be doing things for other people. So don't short circuit God's plan of you being a giver by saying, I'm going to be a getter. Don't be covetous like the rich young person who went away and didn't give to the poor. Be like Jesus who sacrificed his own life. He gave that we could have life and life abundantly and life eternally. So yes, be sacrificial in whatever you have been given. Be sacrificial, give, and it might even hurt a little bit, but give so that others can give. Make sure you take care of yourself, and we're gonna be covering this later, but have as your major priority seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And this kingdom of God and what is right is giving to others, showing love to others, sacrificial, unconditional love for others. Then in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, here's where we take point number one from. It says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and be confident, have faith, be confident that all these things, clothes and food, shall be added to you. Now, God gives us an example of Solomon. This is why he talked about Solomon. Look at how Solomon is dressed so wonderfully, dressed befitting a king. Look at his crown of gold and his golden clothes, his golden rings. Solomon is dressed and he's wealthy. How did he get that way? God gave him all of his wealth. God made sure that he was wealthy. God is a God of prevision and provision. He saw in advance Solomon's mind, his thought. He saw in, his, in advance Solomon's heart, his emotion. He saw in advance Solomon's actions, what he would do. And because he's a God of prevision, he made provision for Solomon to be wealthy. So Solomon had food, money, and materials. People brought him stuff from all over the known world. So he had plenty. But how did he get that? Well, in 2 Chronicles chapter 1, this is in 2 Chronicles chapter 1 and verses 7 through 12, it tells us, now I'm only going to read verses 11 through 12, but verses 11 through 12, as you can see on the screen, God said to Solomon, because you have not asked for riches, honor, or long life, but instead have asked for wisdom and knowledge that you might judge my people Therefore, wisdom and knowledge is granted to you in addition to riches and honor. That's how Solomon got to be so wealthy because he was in this cycle of giving because he wanted to be like God. His cycle of giving was, God, I want you to give me wisdom and knowledge so that I can rule your people well. You said that I'm going to be a king. Well, as a king, I need to look out for the people that you have entrusted to me. So I want to do good for them. I want to be a giver like you've given to me. So please give me this wisdom so that I know how to guide people so that they can dominate their dominion and they can learn to do well for themselves. I want to be a facilitator and help them to do that. So please give me this knowledge and wisdom. And God Almighty, who had the prevision to put Solomon into a position of being king over the nation of Israel, he made provision for him by giving Solomon not only knowledge and wisdom, but also he gave him riches and honor. That's why Solomon was debt <laughs> to the nines. But God said, even though I did this for Solomon, he was not dressed as nicely as the lilies of the valley. And even though people brought food, spices to Solomon from all over the world, nothing could match the fact, the simplicity, the beauty, 
that conjures up this thought of faith that an, an eagle could be on a branch high up in a tree and without even flapping its wings, just jump off, spread its wing, go on the air current, swoop down, see this gigantic salmon and just grab it without even again flapping its wings, just grab it from the water and then take off soaring in the air and that's its food and it has it in abundance whenever it wants to. A simple bird, God does it for a bird. Of course he's gonna do it for people and Solomon is an example where God did that for Solomon. God provided all of the clothes and all of the food that Solomon could ever want where he was the richest person who's ever lived. Yes, even richer than Jeff Bezos who owns Amazon. Solomon was richer than him. He was certainly more well-dressed than Jeff Bezos or any other person who has on the modern-day clothes that we wear. Uh, Solomon was arrayed in the finest of clothes, had the finest of food. That is an example of what God will do for us if we, like Solomon, look out for other people. Solomon had a certain dominion. And his dominion was the nation of Israel, the land of Israel. And he wanted to dominate it in a godly way, saying that I'm going to make sure that this entire nation is prosperous. I will do everything I can to make sure that no one goes hungry, that no one lacks for anything. Because Solomon was in that cycle of giving, looking, how can I help people? How can I give to the poor and make it where people aren't poor? How can I share all the wealth that God has given to me? Because Solomon wanted to do that, to dominate his dominion, dominate his finances. Because he wanted to do that, God provided for him so that he could stay in that cycle because Solomon was a part of the body of Christ. He was a part of the church in the Old Testament. So if we are truly a part of the body of Christ, then we should be the mouth that speaks loving, kind, encouraging words to people. And we should be the hands that reach out and give people food and give people clothes or give them money to buy that. We should be the body of Christ in this cycle of giving. So when my head, heart, and hands having to do the head, the thoughts, the heart, the emotions, the hands, the actions. So when my head, heart, and hands, my thoughts, emotions, and actions are focused on spiritual things, God will supply physical things to ensure that I'm taken care of. So he's going to take care of my physical thing. He will enrich me physically, and I will be more importantly enriched spiritually. I will be building up treasures in heaven. Remember this saying, God increases our standard of living in order to increase our standard of giving. I'll repeat that. God increases our standard of living in order to increase our standard of giving. The more God blesses you, the more you should bless others. And God will make sure that not only will our cup overflow, God will make sure that our barrels overflow. Think about a rain barrel, a 275-gallon rain barrel that you attach to the downspout coming off of your roof. And let's say that you have it on all four corners of your house. So four 275-gallon water barrels where you collect this water. And it rains because God is the one who sends the rain down from heaven. That's one of the storehouses of treasures that he pours out, opening up the sky and pouring down. Each drop of rain should be considered like a thousand dollars. And how many millions and maybe even billions of drops of rain pours down in one rainstorm? And all of our barrels not only are filled in one rainstorm, but they overflow such that I need to now go out and get these five gallon buckets from Home Depot or Lowe's, for instance, 
because all of my 275, all four of them, my 275 gallon uh, barrels that I collect the rainwater from, they're overflowing. And so now I'm using five gallon buckets to collect more rain. That's how God blesses us. That's how we should think about it. The more we give, the more God gives to us. So God increases our standard of living in order to increase our standard of giving. Have faith that if you are like God and God is love, God gives. If you are like God and you give out of love, then God is going to continue to bless you so you can bless others. That's when you truly will have treasures in heaven. That's what it means to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness because God is good all of the time. God is love. He wants us to be loved. He wants us to be good and giving generously from the heart all of the time. So thanks for watching this program. This program was sponsored by Christian Ambassadors. Please watch the next program in this series titled Work Hard. We've covered the first point, which is seek first the kingdom of God. In our next program, we're going to cover the second point, which is to work hard. Again, thank you for joining me in this program.